we did have one question on along that is, fits along these lines. Do you both, what do you both believe about the, if there are any differences between, uh, let me see, let me find it again, a boycott and cancel culture, or does one fit into the other? Everybody loves boycotts. Uh, everybody, like, whenever the Goya boycott started, you saw these Republicans going out, what a bunch of snowflakes, what a bunch of babies, they're up, they just, all the cancel culture, they, we don't do that. We're, we're human beings, we're men, we never boycott, except for the NFL, yeah. Uh, we, but we never, boycott, except for NASCAR, whenever they ban the flag, we don't boycott at, uh, oh, the Colin Kaepernick thing, uh, you can't nail it in a football game, but except for that, no, no, we, we will not accept that. But, but we, we honor free speech all the time. But, yeah, everybody likes boycotts. Everybody boycotts. If I don't like a company's policies, um, then I usually will not buy it. I, I, when I used to drink beer more, I would go and drink Heineken. Then not Heineken. Uh, uh, see how long it's been? Gingling. I would not know. Funny. I would not know. I was sitting at a bar drinking a Yingling, and guy goes, "Oh, so you like Donald Trump? Because Yingling supports Donald Trump." And I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but then I, I, I finished the beer, you know, and I, I've ordered Yingling since then. Um, but well, one thing I realized that we haven't done yet is we haven't defined what cancel culture is. We haven't defined our terms. So, Dr. Fair, how would you define cancel culture? And I'm excited to see how Clay defines it. We can talk about your differences there. I'm probably going to bounce off hers to define it the way. So. Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I'm not a theorist of this, so I'm not, I'm not the right person. I'm, I'm just basically a person who thinks that freedom of speech is really important. Um, I, I will defend your right to be offensive. I just wish that others would defend my speech rights as much as I will defend theirs. And it has been my experience that the right wing has, despite all of its proclamations that liberals are snowflakes, um, they are actually the biggest snowflakes I've ever encountered. I mean, that woman said terrible things about American rape culture. Get her fired. That. <laughs> I agree with you right there. Conservatives are the biggest snowflakes, which is why they say it. But they project I mean, everything they say. Yeah, and so, that's I mean, why I think this freedom of this speech debate, I like bringing the science in because it, it, you, we didn't have this science 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So mm -hmm. we have this science now. And, and, and having jackasses, you know, we, we can, you know, I, I can, you can't swing a dead cat in this town without hitting um, a jackass. If you opine <laughs> about this issue, who haven't bothered to actually read about the science. And I think we should really go into some of the questions that you asked about, you know, offensive op-eds in college newspapers. Mm -hmm. It's very different for a college newspaper than it is in New York Times. Yeah. Chances are, kids are going to be reading the college newspaper op-ed. Well, right. And I guess that's a question I wanted to ask you earlier. Um, do you think that there should be, of course, the fact this was on a student's personal blog throws a wrench yeah, in the conversation. It shouldn't even, even be anyone's business what this dude <laughs> wrote on his blog. I'm, I'm annoyed that people are annoyed. But the process worked, right? People knew about it. The university responded. I mean, not the university, but the student body responded mm -hmm. with appropriate speech in response. That's how it's supposed to work. One person is an idiot. You think this person is an idiot, and you make an effective argument about their idiocy. Well, some. Well, that's the thing is, some people on Georgetown's campus have made the argument that what the student. I don't want to talk about any particular campus. Okay, sure thing. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> cool. I mean, in in terms of youth free speech, um, and maybe we could set the college newspaper thing. Just say young people speaking their minds. Should there be different rules for what young people are allowed to say to an audience of mostly other young people because of that science? And I'm glad we're bringing the science into it. Yeah, well, I mean, this is kind of where I go because there's a thin line between some of this and bullying. Mm. Right? Bullying is not victimless. Um, the things that victims of bullying um, hear will be with them the rest. Like I said, I was very much bullied as a, as a fat, just, I've had this, I've had these spectacles on since I was old enough to remember. Um, so, you know, jungle hair, spectacles, and being fat and being poor white trash, you can imagine the, the, the enjoyable things that I had to endure. So I think that the response to this, though, is that people should really be studying this. Right? We should all be engaging the science. Um, I wish that the scientists who are working on this 
would write op-eds in places that are easily digestible. Here's how your speech, actually I saw a really interesting op-ed about this. I, I, I wish I had saved it. The writer actually made these points. Sometimes the best response is not more speech, but rather for that speech to have not been published in the first place because this was harmful speech. And I don't mean harmful in terms of sentiment. I mean harmful in terms of brain chemistry. Hmm. And this is the discussion that I think we need to have first before but, we start making rules. Like we just had someone in the comments say that we need to be careful about distinguishing young people from adults. I'm, I think in the free, of course we do, especially like- well, No, there is a science, so there is, so I make a scientific distinction. Oh no, and I was the one who messed up there. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I, I meant like in, in Mike pointed that out. Um, like when we're talking about drunk driving, that obviously is a different conversation, but when we're talking about brain chemistry, <laughs> or we're talking about uh, people being mentally, experiencing mental trauma based on right. words, I think that's a very different conversation that where it's okay to talk about young people versus adults. Mike, do you agree? <laughs> I'll be very so, with you. Well, I mean, so there's, this is, so there's no right answer to this, right? Because there's, you know, there's a normal distribution. Right? <laughs> right. And, um, and so brain plasticity, the, the end of brain plasticity, is also going to fall along that normal distribution. Some mm -hmm. people's brains may, be, um, may lose brain plasticity by the time they're 20. Uh, for some, they'll be in the tails of the distribution, and their brains may still have plasticity well into their 20s. So this is, um, so it's a statistical answer, right? But even if you make your, your most scientific, so what you have to basically do, right, your, your you have to do what statisticians do, which is you're trading off the likelihood that a certain part of this population is going to be harmed versus the harm of needlessly infringing upon speech rights. Mm -hmm. Like you're looking at what's the optimization of that intersection. Mm -hmm. And you can't have that discussion without bringing not only the constitutionalists, right, but also the scientists. And right now, the scientists have not been brought into this. Thing.